Uh, this is an interview of Audrey Wallace Wagner, who uh, was a defense worker during World War II at the Cambridge Public Library, Cambridge, New York, Wednesday, May 22, 2002, uh, approximately 1.30 p.m. Interviewer Michael Russert. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your background, your your name, and where you were born, and when? Well, um, unfortunately, I can remember when. <laughs> 1924. But uh, I was born down in Jamaica Hospital, Jamaica, Long Island. And uh, my name was Wallace at that point, Audrey Mildred Wallace. And uh, I went to school in Hicksville. Uh, the um, Catholic school had the you know, lower grades. I went there the eight years. And then I went into Hicksville High for, I graduated at the end of three, three years. And uh, right then, the war was hyper. And I said to my mother, well, you know, I'm out of school now. I'd like to get a job someplace. So a neighbor of ours knew someone in Grumman's. And of course, Grumman's were in Beth Page, which was practically on the fringe of Hicksville. So, Excuse me a second. Um, how old were you when uh, you graduated from high school? Well, eight years grammar school and three years additional high school. So 30, or no, I'm sorry, I'm going by years. Okay. Does that come uh, to, I'm terrible at math. <laughs> uh, 17 or 18. 17, then, yeah. yeah. So um, I got an interview with them, and they said at this point they were taking women in for possible uh, riveting, but they had a six weeks course, and the only place it was being given was over in Hempstead. Well, Hempstead wasn't too far from us, and I happened to have an aunt and a cousin who lived there, so I could go stay there without trying to commute back and forth, because I didn't drive at that time. So I went over and I took the course, and it seemed to me when I look back on it that they gave us an awful lot of stuff we weren't going to use. Like, I mean, they had templates for us to draw, uh, scale uh, things with a, with a needle. You know, like if you were going to design something, we weren't going to do anything like that. Mm -hmm. But they did show us the basic of riveting, which they assumed we'd be able to do. And they said to us the reason why they were interested in getting some women was that most women have a smaller hand to get into areas because both hands have to be in. One has to be around to hold the backer or the buffer and then one to hold the rivet gun, like that. What was the buffer used for? Well, if, you're, if you put a rivet into a hole like that, you want to squash the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to have something to back it up to hit it, you see. Mm -hmm. Or else it's not going to flatten out. You can't just put the rivet in the hole and then use the gun, the rivet gun. If there's nothing in the back to keep it from slipping out. So there had to be two hands. Mm -hmm. Well. In the section that I eventually wound up in was in uh, plant three of Grumman's where they handled the wings and the uh, control area. And the wings, of course, have uh, smaller areas and women could get in there and get their hand in the back and that, you know. So they had a lot of the girls doing riveting in the wings. And I only did it for a little while when they needed someone in the control department for the, the final uh, assembly. And of course, I had always been a an airplane nut. I mean, I just loved it. I would have loved to have learned to fly and, and everything. Oh, to be able to see the cockpit and the pedals and the joystick and everything. This was great. I, I volunteer, you know. So, uh, got in. And of course, we were working on the Hellcat, their fighter pilot plane, rather. And uh, it had to be, it was going to be used in nautical circumstances on board ship with the salt water and everything. They sprayed everything that was metallic that could be bothered by this sort of thing with peralcachone, which was a greenish, like a paint almost. And when you assembled things, you had to be very careful that you didn't nick it, because if you did, the whole thing had to be taken apart and resprayed again. So they said, we want we feel that women are more used to doing smaller, finer things, like sewing and knitting and things like that. You'd probably be more careful than a man might be rougher. So they put us on, and there were a couple of women in my department that were doing it. So of course we put the, joy, the joystick and the pedals and uh, around the edge where these different dials fit, you know. And fortunately I didn't nick anything, but the inspectors came around to make sure that you didn't 
because they didn't want any, you know, problem because the, the Hellcat was the one that had the wings that could fold, fold up and they could have just so many on a carrier, you know, they had to have room for that kind of a plane and they didn't want to get it out there and all of a sudden find out the plane was rusting because it hadn't been handled properly. So we did that and we worked, uh, I think it was 8 o'clock I had to be there in the morning until 4.30. And you took your lunchbox with your lunch. And when you went in, your lunchbox was opened and checked. Uh, when you left, the same thing, to make sure you weren't taking anything with you that you shouldn't be. We also had a time clock with cards we had to punch in. And I loved it, every bit of it. I mean, it was my first job, but nevertheless, it was something that I'd always been interested in anyway, you know. So to me, it was like a vacation. I mean, I didn't, I didn't feel I was under any stress at all. What were your hourly wages? <laughs> what were what? Your pay. How much did you get paid? I'm uh, trying to remember that. What I used to do, it's, the reason it's difficult for me to remember, I was the only one working at home at that time. And I just brought my check and handed it to my mother. So I really couldn't tell you uh, what I make, made. But it was a good salary, apparently, and better than what I went into later, I know that much. But uh, anyway, uh, it was great. They had uh, music on, you know, soft for you. There wasn't anything ever unfriendly. I mean, the men didn't resent us, the women coming in at all. I mean, we were all just, you know, wonderful friends. What did and, you wear to work every day? Yeah. And then there were a lot of men that were there that did not qualify for military, either because of age or a problem, a health problem. So they were doing what they felt mm -hmm. they could do, too, for the war effort. You know? What did you wear to work every day? We had, um, it was like a suit, a one-piece suit with a zipper down the front, and it was made out of denim, navy blue mm -hmm. denim, with a belt mm -hmm. and buckles on it. It was, wasn't bad. I wish I had kept it. I wouldn't be able to get into it, though, now. <laughs> but, uh, it was comfortable to work in, and you could crawl around. You wouldn't have been able to do things like that with skirts because you were going up and down ladders and things like that, so you had to be dressed that way. And we also, if you had long hair, it had to be confined in some way with either a cap or you had to braid it. Or I had quite long hair at the time, and I used to braid it and cross it in the back, and I'd sort of just keep it tightly braided because if any kind of air disturbed, you know, with the propellers and things like that, and also some of the instruments that would blow it around. It could have been quite a problem. Uh, trying to think of something else that would be of interest. Uh, we had, <laughs> there was a test pilot, uh, Bobby Converse, and he used to come down. We'd be, I used to take the train from Hicksville, if I couldn't get a ride with somebody, to Bethpage, and they had a special, uh, little stop for the train, the Long Island Railroad, with a little lean-to shed, you know, for us to get in out of the rain and that sort of thing. And if Bobby was up in a plane, he'd come down and bounce the wheels off the roof. And oh, we just thought this was great. <laughs> well, poor Bobby came to a bed, and he, uh, while I was working there, something went wrong in his plane. And he knew he was coming down. There wasn't much he could do about it except try to get it in someplace. So he sacrificed his life because it was, the developments were starting at that time. This was pre, um, uh, later on, but they were still, and where he was coming down, he was losing, he couldn't do anything much for the plane. I mean, it was going to come down where it wanted to. So he was going to try to maneuver it so he could get between two houses without landing on a house. And he folded the wings in the air. Wow. So he lost complete control and uh, he was killed, of course. Well, because they felt that it was a control error, something had happened that he couldn't control. They brought the whole control section, the center section of the plane in. And I'll never forget it when they opened the big doors and they brought this in. I think you could have heard a pin drop there because everybody liked this guy. We knew what he'd done. And to wonder, you know, what could have possibly happened. And we just stood there, and it was very impressive because the inside of the cockpit, of course, is sprayed with the screen stuff, but with Bobby's accident, it was covered with blood. Mm. And, of course, he was not in it any longer, but uh, you knew how he died, which must have been pretty awful. I don't know whether they ever really did find out what happened, but um, 
It was there was always something going on. Uh, there were the people that were working there were like there was a young man who didn't have too good a health, so he couldn't go into the military. But he and his wife used to be a dance couple with Xavier Kugak's orchestra. So he was there. And then there was a great big heavy set elderly man that says, Oh hell, I want to do something for the war effort too, you know. And we called him Tiny, and Tiny was like this. But he also did filing in small sedentary type jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. Nothing was asked of us that uh, was dangerous or really very difficult at all. I mean, uh, as, of course, I enjoyed my work very much. Were there a lot of social functions at the factory? Uh, not Did you really. develop a lot of friendships? Yes, uh, they didn't hold on to terribly long, but uh, I've often wondered even now what happened to a couple of them that I got quite friendly with. But uh, at noontime, we, if it was a nice day, we used to go out. They had uh, like a park area where you could have your lunch. And uh, they'd play baseball and that sort of thing, you know, the men. We'd walk around and uh, talk. and So there wasn't that much. I mean, we didn't have parties or dances or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were there to work, mm -hmm. and that was it. Mm -hmm. But um, I know it was one of my, my favorite uh, times, really. No, although I wasn't doing really very much riveting, as I said, I did a little bit of it, but then they found that they needed help in the other section, so you did what you were asked. But Grumman's were nice to work for, they were really very nice. Gave us a bonus at Christmas. Yeah, and uh, they, they made you feel that even if you weren't an, you know, a real genius on the things you were doing, you were still doing a good job, and there was no pressure. It all. So as a result, I've noticed in several of my jobs since if there's no pressure hanging over you, you're more inclined to do what they want you to do at a faster rate because you don't have the pressure. You're doing it on your own, you know, and that's the way they were. They were really nice people to work for. And I've often wondered, I don't, haven't been down to the island in a long time as to whether the factories are still there or the same. And, what they do, you know, or not, I just wonder, it was a special time in my life. How long were you at Grauman? Not, well, it must have been about a year and a half, two years, something like that. I'm not, not just quite sure. Uh, I didn't keep any records of it, you know, so it's a little bit difficult to tell. But then my sister was the secretary to the, uh, let's see, the president of Long Island Lighting Company. And at that time, you couldn't change your job just because you didn't like it. Uh, it had to go into another a type of work that was uh, the, that the war was dependent on, which of course electricity was, you know. And uh, so she said to me, you know, I think it might be a good idea if you got in there because it was getting to a point where transfers were not all that easy to get. And she said, you know, you're not, once the war is over, you're not going to be able to stay here. They won't have work for you. Do you think about coming in? I could get you a job. Mm -hmm. So I got in, and it was a very boring job, <laughs> taking phone calls for people that wanted service put in. Of course, Levittown was very, very early beginning then. And they were laying down roads as to how they were going to set up the housing developments and that when the war was over. And uh, so you, somebody maybe that had a cottage over in Jones Beach and they wanted the service turned on for the summer and things like that, and you're taking telephone orders and it's a bore. <laughs> Nothing like Roman, believe me. But I made a lot of friends there and I worked with them for quite a while. And then a girl that worked with me in the office, um, she had just gotten out of school and her neighbor worked at the racetrack, the thoroughbred racing. And she said, uh, I'm going in on the weekend for an interview. I want to get an office job. It would probably be in the city. Well, I was dying to get into the city at that point. These were world shows were and everything, you know. And if you took the Long Island Railroad in from Hicksville, and then you had to buy a ticket, you know, and then get back and everything, it was a little bit more than I could afford. Whereas if I had a commutation ticket, it was good for seven days a week for the whole month. And uh, I could go in over weekends and things like that if I wanted. So. I went in with her, and at the time, the woman that uh, interviewed her said, 
it was with the, a club that they had at the racetrack for very wealthy members and that. And she said, but there's an opening with the Chalky Club, which they're the keepers of the American Stud Book. And she said, um, they need office talk. If you want to go around while you're here, maybe you could get a job with them. So I did. And uh, it was interesting because you, of course, at that time, this was pre-computers. Everything was done by hand. You had rows and rows of files. You had to check up everything like that. Uh, there has to be so many letters in a horse's name. And that can't exceed that. It can't be something that is um, not acceptable uh, or something that's in use or if it was a famous name. So he went through all these drawers checking out names and applications to register falls. And then eventually uh, the head of the jockey club had a secretary that always went with him to the track and she got sick for a few days and he needed somebody to go with him so he asked me to go. And he found out that I, that I was a flight nut. <laughs> and he had a little private plane out in the Hicksville uh, private airport. And uh, so every once in a while, he'd come into me in the afternoon and say, get your coat, we're going flying. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> so if it's, I was meeting an awful lot of awfully nice people and getting to know quite a bit about thoroughbred racing. And uh, I did a few years with her and then uh, into another facet of the people that do the sales. So that meant some traveling. And of course, the war was all over at this point, you know. And um, I got to work with this uh, company that were uh, getting horses brought in by plane. So I was in and out of the airport all the time for that. And Go back to the war a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the war were, was. Uh, um, what kind of shortages were there? This was the thing that I found out later when I went to England for the first time what really rationing was, mm -hmm. because ours was a laugh. I mean, we were supposed to, certain things were supposed to be rationed, but they were always available. Uh, we weren't really out of anything. And when I look back on it, uh, and we had enough food, enough delicacies or anything that you would want. It wasn't anything, you know, that, that uh, we didn't have. Whereas they, for 14 years, had to stand in lines for sh shoes and clothing and food and everything, which was really rough. We didn't have that, fortunately, at least in that area. Maybe in other areas it might have been different. But um, when I look back at it now, I mean, the fact that we were at war, I think the closest thing I came to it, my sister used to teach ballroom dancing. And of course, Mitchell Field wasn't far away from us. And a few of the boys were being invited to the USO parties and things mm -hmm. like that. And these were country boys that didn't know how to dance, you know. So my sister was teaching them. And they found out that I was an airplane nut. <laughs> it was funny. They came over this one day with their uniforms on and said, get your coat, we're taking you over to Mitchell Field. And uh, they took me in and they had the old trainers, the old two-wing trainers there. They let me get sit in one of them, you know, and took me all around and, oh, I was on cloud nine. <laughs> I often wonder whether they made it out. They were awfully nice boys, young boys. But um, after, you know, everything was sort of going off then. I mean, uh, by the time I got out of Grumman's, it was coming to an end, except for, of course, the uh, Japanese situation. And, uh, of course, Grumman's were active with that because of the Navy planes. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, how, did, how did you feel about what was going on in the war in general? Did you keep up with the news of what was going on? Yes, and I had a correspondent in England, a young girl, and we, you know, wrote letters back and forth so I knew what it was like. And it was, I thought we were very, very lucky. Uh, we weren't really deprived of food or anything. We weren't in danger here. Although, living on Long Island, a couple of U-boats came up pretty close to Jones Beach. We didn't see them, but we heard that they had come up quite close. So, if it had gone on much longer, I think uh, 
they would have, you know, we would have seen more of it here, which wasn't very nice to look forward to. But uh, then, of course, the Japanese attacking us at Pearl Harbor, there were a couple of boys left lost on the Arizona that I'd gone to school with, and that hit home. I mean, these things were all during a war. I don't know whether it's the same now, but at that time, it really didn't hit home unless it was somebody that you knew or somebody in your family. I mean, yes, it was a terrible thing that was happening, but it wasn't a personal thing, a personal loss or anything like that. Uh, but it got to be with the Japanese. I mean, that was really a bit scarier, I think, than the European thing. So that was sort of taping off and being settled, you know. But. Um, the other part of it was a bit scary to know that uh, they had been in and out of the country and doing all sorts of things like this, and then to come into Pearl Harbor with absolutely no provocation at all. I mean, that was... How did you feel when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Very upset. As I said, having known a couple of boys that were on the Arizona, mm -hmm. and while I had never been to Hawaii or anything, I'd seen pictures of it, and it was so beautiful. And to know that they had been planning this and coming closer and closer and closer to make that right was, it was really scary. It was something that you thought about, you went to sleep, and then of course, at night, I used to lie there and hear the, the B-17s go over. They were going over to Europe. There'd be a formation of them and you could tell this particular drone. And I used to lay there and think, please get there, it's safe. You know, because the ocean is a long, long ways away. And of course, they would go up to uh, walk north before they went across. They didn't do the straight across like they do now. But I'd lay there and think, gee, I hope they, they get there safe. And my sister, of course, uh, having that dance studio, that was great that time with the boys. They were giving me of their time so that I could see what the planes were like. But, um, of course, I had other friends that were still with Grumman's, you know, and it wasn't until the war really started to kind of go off that they started leaving their jobs, too. So I hadn't been with the lighting company uh, too long enough of it, though. <laughs> and then getting in with thoroughbred racing, that was of interest, too, whereas mm -hmm. the the work with Grumman was very interesting to me. What was your reaction to the uh, use of the atomic bomb on Japan? Uh, I just wish they hadn't discovered it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what did you think at the time? Scary. I mean, when we saw the first tests that they had done with it and then knowing what they were thinking of doing and then dropping it over there. When the news came through what it was like to go into Japan after that had happened, how you could see the etching of a person on a wall mm -hmm. was all that was left of him. I mean, we didn't know what this thing was, it was possible to do. We had never had anything like this, you know. And it was scary to know. and hoping that it would not get out of hand. And then I think the first thing that struck us was that, oh God, if Hitler ever does anything like this. And he, from what I've read, he was coming pretty close to mm -hmm. using uh, atomic uh, warheads and things. Mm -hmm. And of course- what, what do you remember about your reactions to both the, the victory in Europe and the victory in Japan days? The victory in Japan? I was in Europe. In, in Europe or Japan? Both. both? Uh, well, Japan, I think, was sort of overshadowed, shadowed rather, by the atomic bomb, knowing that we had to go that far to do something. We had to stop it, mm -hmm. and that was the only way we could do it. And in Europe, it seemed to, of course, my, my sister had a French uh, correspondent that she had from the time she was in school. and. Uh, so she was hearing what it was like when the Germans started to come into France, you know, and that. <clears throat> and and uh, we had a lot of English friends. And uh, a lot of the stories that were coming through were very upsetting. I mean, to know that this was all happening, in fact, people were saying, oh, but we're going to be safe, you know, they, they can't get here. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the heck they couldn't what if they were wanted some of to. your most memorable events or things that you really remember from that period? Riding all over Hicksville on a fire truck <laughs> when the war was over. <laughs> <laughs> big fire truck came down the road and says, come on, we're going to take a ride. They went through town blowing the horns and everything. Oh, that was, it was a wonderful release to know that it was over. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, it was, I think the thing that I got the most out of that time was working around something that I that was really interested in, which was flight and doing something with my hands. I've always been very clever with my hands. Mm -hmm. Things come to me easy that I can do, like uh, sewing, knitting, crocheting, or anything that never bothered me. And of course, using any kind of tools like that, like to the riveting and that. I felt very comfortable with that. And uh, building something has always sort of fascinated me. And of course, the planes themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I look back on it as one of the best times of my life. Knowing not only you would was you say the war had a very positive effect on some of the things that you did. Yes, uh, I think it, the thing that impressed me the most is I was not only doing something to help, which we all felt we should do, but I was doing something that I really enjoyed. Uh, as I said, I've always liked to do things with my hands, and flight airplanes and everything were my particular favorite thing. So all of that bonded together was. Uh, you know, very rewarding. Not that I would want to see another one mm -hmm. come. <laughs> and uh, did lose lose friends that uh, I lost a boyfriend on in the service and with the Japanese war too. So it's okay. Well, that's thank it. You. Yes. Well, Thank I hope I've much. given you a little, no, I, you know, so. idea yeah. of what it was like at that time. Of course, other people had other experiences, yes. possibly, but I seem to have had a scattering of them, like losing friends and doing work I enjoyed, mm -hmm. and uh, lucky enough to work for a nice company, you know, too, which was great. What do you think made Grumman so nice to work for? What were some of the things that made it so nice? I don't know. Uh, we never really saw too much of the powers to be, you know, the uh, the bosses and that. But everything seemed to run so smooth. I mean, there was never a, they were on. They must have been under a certain amount of pressure to turn out so many planes and that. But they never made us feel that way. I mean, not that we sat around and lounged all the time. We didn't. We kept working because we knew at the back of our minds what we were doing had to be done and get out there, you know, so it, they can use these planes. But uh, nobody was ever throwing their weight around or uh, and creating any kind of pressure or uh, unfriendliness. And uh, it, was, it was a nice, nice company to work for. I've found uh, since then, uh, when I was still living on Long Island, there's a man that lived across the street from us and he worked with Grumman's, but I think he was in the office. He wasn't uh, doing anything. And he said that. He said they had a reputation for being uh, a nice outfit, and they were. They also turned out great planes. One of the boys that I met at the racetrack said, oh, geez. He said, I used to be on an aircraft carrier. We had to fold those. We had to stash those planes in, into the space that we had, and those wings that they folded back, you know, he said, were, they made a great plane. I said, maybe you were working on one of mine. <laughs> but um, looking back on it, it was, as I said, I didn't lose anyone terribly close to me. I wasn't under, under any personal threat. But I still felt this involvement. I was part of it. Mm -hmm. And that was nice to look back on, to know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope it'll be all right. Oh, no, that was fun. That was nice. A friend gave me this as yeah. a joke. <laughs> this one was when you were how old? Um, 1942 to 43. It's got, okay. I was born 20, 24. Was so that? about 21? Yeah, about okay. that. Uh -huh. And then, did you get that one? Did you get this, this one was her in front of the factory. It's the only one she said she had. That was when I was taking the course, you know. Okay, we got it. All right. And then can he take this little 
thing. I don't know whether it's yep. show up on yep. anything. Can you get that? But you'll have to stand back farther. Oh, I see. I, I can zoom in on it. Okay, but you can get it, it good. That was our little button for the E effort, the extra E for excellence. They they won the award, and so they gave us all a pin for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Got it. Got it. Good. All right. Thanks. That's a treasure. <laughs>